has published original research on this topic and is viewed as the founder of palliative care for Parkinson's disease. In 2015, Dr. Miyasaki, sorry about that, established the Complex Neurological Symptoms Clinic at the K. Edmonton Clinic, University of Alberta, with Dr. Wendy Johnston, an expert in ALS. This program provides care to all neurologic patients with palliative care needs. Recent research includes a study of positive psychology applied to recently diagnosed people with Parkinson's and a large multi-center randomized control study of ambulatory palliative care in Parkinson's disease funded by the Patient-Centered Outcome Outcomes Research Institute in the USA. In 2019, Dr. Miyasaki received the Louise Plusi Award for Excellence in Clinical Care, Research, and Advocacy. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for uh, logging in remotely. And I hope we are all staying safe and physically distanced. So um, today, um, I'm speaking about caregivers and care partners. And some of you may be wondering, what do I know about this? Um, many of you have heard me speak and know that my mother had Lewy by dementia. So I know what it is like to be an adult child of someone who has a Parkinson disease or Parkinson-like disorder. And it is challenging because you have to navigate your relationship anew. Um, and how do we manage that and not lose ourselves and not, um, not let it be overwhelming? I don't have any magic bullet or answers, but I do want to emphasize the importance that you all are serving for patients with Parkinson's. So um, I'm not going to do the fancy share screen, but I'm just going to hold up a paper for you. Um, so let's see. Yes, you can see it. Okay. So this is a paper that uh, came from our bigger study. And thank you to those of you who have logged in and were part of that study. But it's about patient and caregiver characteristics and caregiver burden. And um, right now, we measure caregiver experience more as burden. It isn't always burdensome. And most of you know that. There are moments of joy, moments of great satisfaction. And also, it is a gift to be able to serve in this role. But there is no doubting that there are times when you are definitely a caregiver, not a care partner. And um, our study looked at some of those things. What was interesting to note was it wasn't the patient's perception of how they were doing that impacted the caregivers most. It was the caregiver's perception of how the patient was doing. And this speaks to, it is sometimes our own um, personal viewpoint or our own disappointments or sadness and grief over what our loved one is undergoing that actually causes us great pain and burden. And I think that highlights, for me at least, it's important for us to try and take the person's perspective. If the person is still enjoying things, still enjoying families and outings and just simple things like, thank goodness the sun's out today in Edmonton. That's a joyful thing. Um, thank goodness that they still have my favorite ice cream in supply at the local grocery store. If you can still take joy in those things, I hope that we as the people who care and love people with Parkinson's, that we can also see that there is still joy left. Yes, life is different, but it can still have meaning and happiness and love. Um, the other aspects from the study are that it was often the caregiver's 
own health and their own mental health that affected how they viewed the caregiving experience. And that's not surprising. You know, think of when was the last time you personally went to a doctor or a dentist and it wasn't for your loved one? When was the last time you did something really nice for yourself? Because your whole life is consumed with keeping this person going and not necessarily what you need to recharge. And it's important for all of us to realize that we have those needs and pushing them down or ignoring them doesn't make it go away. And it doesn't help us be the best that we can be. Um, I think that one of the challenges as a caregiver is to say, I can't do that. Or I need a break. I need just four hours to sit in a coffee shop and do nothing. And that's okay. Um, or one of my uh, patient's wives who said, I go into the bathroom, I turn on the shower and I scream. And I just have to. To give ourselves the permission to be human because um, some of my patient spouses say, you keep telling me I'm doing a good job, but I'm so mean, I'm so impatient but they're being human and we're all human. Um, so to be kinder to yourself, because I think sometimes we say such critical things to ourselves, we wouldn't say that to our worst enemy, but somehow we feel free to be that critic for ourselves. And so I want to give you the permission to silence that critic to be kinder to yourself and to also give yourself permission to ask for help. Um, we're very blessed in Alberta compared to many other provinces, at least for now, I'm not sure what Jason Kenney has in mind for the future. Um, but you know, for now, we are so fortunate that home care resources are much more robust than many other provinces. We have a lot of outpatient services that are available to our patients and specifically tailored for Parkinson's disease. And we need to take advantage of them. So I would also encourage you when your family doctor or your neurologist says, hey, what about this program? To try and have an open mind. I know that for some people, you just kind of think, are you kidding me? It's everything I can do to get breakfast on the table, get the pills laid out, get the person showered and dressed and keep the house, you know, clean enough not to be, uh, not to be declared a health hazard. <laughs> and you want me now to get this person out to physiotherapy? But I would encourage you to think about these as opportunities, one for your loved one to view other people as possible sources of support and education. And also for you to view these people as resources. Like, I don't know how to safely lift my wife out of the chair. I don't know if it's still safe for my husband to get into a bathtub because the last time he pulled me in and I couldn't get out. These are opportunities to actually use people who have seen this condition or conditions similar many, many times and have either figured out themselves or care partners come and say, hey, I tried this and it worked. So you're getting the knowledge of all the people who have come before you when you access people um, with a special interest in Parkinson's. Um, the other paper that I'm going to hold up is this one.
And both of these are available as, um, I think they're available as open access through the Annals of Palliative Medicine. Um, and spiritual well-being is something that we often don't talk about. Um, in medicine, I know people definitely don't talk about it. It's kind of poo-pooed as uh, something that is really not relevant to a biomedical model. And yet, um, even though our society has become so separated from the church, we are still all searching for meaning. If we weren't all ser searching for meaning, Deepak Chopra wouldn't be so popular. He wouldn't be a multimillionaire. Somewhere, even if we aren't affiliated with formal religion. We want to know what's our place in the universe? Why am I here? How can I get through this suffering? And is there meaning to what I'm experiencing? And so um, this has been a big interest of mine since um, 2007 when a spiritual counselor came up to me and said, you looked after my uncle before he died and you need me. And first of all, she was free labor. So yes, absolutely. Come and join my team. <laughs> but I learned so much from her about how to have conversations, not just about, you know, your on time and your off time and dyskinesias, but what brings you joy? What are you hoping to achieve? And, you know, do you have goals in the next month or the next three months or the next year? And um, what we found in our study was that people who had a strong sense of faith. And it doesn't matter if you worship God or Buddha or um, whatever. But if you have this sense of meaning, a sense of community, and a sense that there is a higher power, these people tended to report less depression and anxiety. And additionally, um, once again, where you, the care partner or caregiver, comes in, those people whose care partners also reported they had a strong sense of faith or spiritual well-being, their um, loved one reported improved spiritual well-being as well. Probably because it was the care partner who said, okay, here we go, we're going to church, or here we go, we're going to the bridge game, or here we go, we're going to go and volunteer at the soup kitchen. And it's leading in that way. And as a caregiver, you are a leader. You're leading your little team to try and have each day be as joyful and as meaningful as possible. And so, I think when, when people um, focus on only the physical aspects of caregiving, they are missing so much more of what you are giving, so much more of the role you're playing, not only for your loved one, but for your family and for society at large. You know, people do watch, people see, and to watch that selflessness is nourishing for all of us. Um, so I, I don't want this to be just a typical lecture where I go blah, 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 blah. But um, I would like to encourage people to ask questions. And I see that there are comments in the chat. And so uh, maybe Declan might want to read out if there are some questions. Yeah, for sure. So I've got a couple on my phone here as well. But we can start with uh, Carolyn in the chat. Uh, what can we do for self-care now as we're in isolation? Oh, 
Yes, um, that is a challenge. Uh, I personally shop a lot on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> and I send things to other people. So um, I, I think it's good when we can give other people something and let them know we are thinking of them. So every day I actually send an email to someone in my contact list and say, hey, how are you doing? Um, I'm thinking of you, is everything okay? And people really appreciate it, um, especially when it comes across, you know, I, I emailed some of my friends in France and Italy, you know, just checking on them. So doing something like that, even though it's a gift to someone else, becomes a gift to you. Um, probably an, another very meaningful exercise I d used to do and kind of fell out of, um, but I'd like to do again, is every month I'd write to someone who I felt had had an impact in my life and thank them for that and explained why it was. And the letters I got back were incredible. Uh, I, I would say almost everyone wrote back a letter and they said, oh my God, I didn't even remember that. Um, and one uh, neurosurgeon who was known for being pretty brusque, he said, are you sure that was me? It sounds too nice to be me, but it really was him. Uh, and I just think that that can be very helpful. Um, you see my Lego behind me. Uh, so I like to do Lego. So instead of listening to the daily news feed on how bad things are south of the border, I do my Lego. So my husband listens to CNN and I do Lego. <laughs> I am feverishly doing Lego because <laughs> there's so much bad news. Um, and then uh, doing something fun for me is baking. So I got the, I managed to score a bag of flour. How lucky am I? Uh, and I'm going to bake a pie. I haven't baked a pie in years. And that way I can bake a pie. My husband and I can eat the pie. <laughs> and, you know, when you're just cooking or doing something like that, it takes you out of the situation. I think that as long as you are still managing physical distancing, you can go out for walks, although this last week in, in Edmonton has been pretty brutal, like so cold my face hurt. But um, otherwise, go out in the sunshine and get fresh air and try and walk, but maintain that physical distance. Um, that's a challenge because my husband, even though he's, he's uh, pretty... Uh, plain spoken. He, he gets, he doesn't know what to do when people keep getting closer and closer to him. And I said, all you have to do is put up your hand and say, I need you to stay six feet away. Sorry, that's just the, the law. So you can sort of blame the law and, but still get out and still feel safe, right? You should feel that you can say that to people and be respected. Um, and then, uh, for three weeks, I was, I, I will admit I was in a funk because I survived a quarantine in SARS. I was, one of my colleagues was quite sick and I was quarantined. And so when this all started, it was very, very hard. And I stopped exercising. And, uh, yesterday I thought I'm, I'm giving this Zoom call, I better start exercising so I could tell them, honestly, exercise will make them feel better because I hate being a hypocrite. Um, so exercise. So whatever you can do, you know, those, those old-fashioned push-ups and burpees, a cheap uh, skipping rope, anything to just keep you active will help reduce some of the stress and um, get you sleeping better. Uh, I also meditate for 25 minutes twice a day. And uh, if I didn't, I'd probably stab someone in the eye with a fork. So, <laughs> so it's very essential for society and myself that I meditate every day. 
Um, but, you know, I say it facetiously, but it is, you know, none of us are at our best during this time. We're all stressed. We're all scared. Um, we don't know what to believe. And so if you can meditate and just clear your mind of all that noise, just, just let it go. It can help you put it in perspective, right? It, we can't control everything. We can control our own behavior. We can try and help other people understand why they need to change their behavior. Um, but the best thing we can do for, our, for society right now is to stay healthy and to stay away from other people. And I think if you can just close your mind and let all that noise, all the craziness just drop away, it can really reduce your stress. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, question number two was, um, and I'll keep the names out of the email one. So. Hello, I was wondering if you could suggest some coping strategies to deal with the ever so slowly progressing decline in mental and physical capabilities of my husband who was diagnosed about 10 and a half years ago. Uh, um, that is a challenge because it is this continual, gradual loss that is, I think, so hard for both the, the person with Parkinson's and their partner, as well as their family, to watch and to acknowledge. Because um, I, I often give the analogy, you know, people with cancer, it is, it is tragic. Cancer is tragic. There is no doubt about it. Um, but in general, it is either put into remission or they have a rapid decline over months to a year or so and they pass away. With our conditions, people continue to progress over years or decades as this writer has elucidated. And um, I think it is important for us to one, uh, not focus on where things will end up, but to be in the present and be in the now and to try and maximize what the capabilities are now. The other is to take control where you can. And I continually see people who would like me to prescribe them a pill but can I get them to the gym? Well, now nobody can go to the gym, but you know, can I get them to exercise? This is the other reason why I started exercising because I thought one day, one of my patients is going to say, and how long do you exercise? So now I can honestly say 35 minutes every single day. Plus they told us not to use elevators anymore in the hospital. So in addition to that 15, flights of stairs every day up. So um, exercise is probably the best treatment that we have so far for motor symptoms, the um, emotional and behavioral symptoms, as well as the cognitive changes. And in fact, even in Alzheimer's research where cognition is the main problem, Vigorous exercisers were seen to, de to deteriorate at a much slower rate. Um, that being said, any amount of exercise is good. So I always tell my patients a moderate amount of exercise. That means, um, so you're slightly short of breath while trying to carry on a conversation during the activity. That's an easy way to tell. And doing that 35 minutes a day for five days a week and to do different exercises. So um, all of us have been walking our dogs endlessly, right? But we should be doing different things. We should be doing different aerobics, doing some weight bearing exercise because 
the body kind of gets used to uh, an activity. So if you change it up, you're more likely to benefit from uh, the different types of exercise. The other is socialization. So in fact, um, a couple, about four years ago, a very famous uh, researcher in cognition gave a talk at the American Academy of Neurology and was talking about all these brain exercises and computer apps that you can sign up for and pay a lot of money for your, um, uh, for your subscription. And what they found, in fact, was that reading the newspaper, debating politics, and playing cards actually had the strongest, most consistent benefit to people. And so what does that tell me? It doesn't tell me that we should all learn to play uh, you know, stud poker. It means that it's the aspect of socializing, right? Being with different people, not just your spouse all the time, playing crib, but going out and being with different people because you are forcing yourself to listen to the cues of the other person, watch the cues of the other person, respond to them, and um, to formulate and logic and have reason, right? So you have, debating politics, you have to have a good premise and you have to be able to articulate it. So simple things can um, be used to help slow that progression. And then uh, for other patients, I say, you know, um, this is a lesson that all doctors and nurses and physios and all of us who are in contact with people with chronic illnesses should have learned, and I fear we do not, is uh, to seize the moment. Whatever you can do today, do it. Right now is, is probably not a great example because we're not supposed to travel and do all those things that are on our bucket list. But there are other things that are on our bucket list, right? Like learn Mandarin. That would be awesome. Uh, I'm not even Chinese, but learn Mandarin. <laughs> Surprise the people in the restaurant when it opens again. Um, I love calligraphy. I collect so many pens and books and everything. Learn a new craft, learn a new skill. So think of things that are on your bucket list that you always put off doing and do them now. Great, thank you. Uh, the third question is along similar lines, but a bit more specific. Um, and it's quite lengthy, so I might cut out some of the details. So apologies to the sender. Um, hi there, I've been struggling with my husband's decline in cognition and changes in behavior. Apart from memory, memory loss, I am seeing scenarios where he is unable to think or respond rationally. There were occasions where he reacted in an outraged manner, swearing and throwing things around. Um, I don't believe he's violent in nature, and I told him in no uncertain terms that that behavior was unacceptable. He admits to the memory loss uh, and attributes it to aging, but is in absolute denial. Um, about the cognitive impairment, though he recognizes that he has difficulty getting organized and motivated. Uh, my question, should I treat him, and this is in quotes, like a normal person, in which case there will be arguments, etc., or should I treat him gently? Thank you. Um, so it's, it's uh, that old adage, um, choose your battles wisely. Uh, so there are some decisions that at this time, probably your spouse should not be making on his own. And in those instances, um, it can be helpful to already formulate in your mind what a good option would be and make a slight variation to that option and ask, whether they choose, whether they think option A or option B is good. That's in terms of decision making. In terms of day-to-day um, -day things, like when he forgets to do something and you've told him to do it, 
uh, there probably is little to be gained with pointing it out. I told you a hundred times to wash your hands after you do that. Um, and you may actually end up triggering a, what's called an explosive response, um, which is just is what it sounds like. Um, and it, it happens because somewhere in your husband's consciousness, he realizes that he has some cognitive changes. And just imagine how painful that is to admit to the world. Um, and how frightening that is to admit to the person he knows best. And so unfortunately, people often take it out on the person they know best. And that is almost always the spouse. Uh, so I would, um, when you see the agitation starting, try and divert attention. So one of my, um, I'll give an example, and this patient has long since passed and was in Toronto, so it's not disclosing anything. Um, she was a very bright woman, a real firecracker, and she directed her investments. Um, and it came to a point where she was extremely demented, but her daughter was so used to her being on the money that she couldn't see it. And so she and her mother would constantly get into arguments and it was driving this really loving daughter crazy. And so I tried to explain she was demented. She, daughter would not hear it. And so I finally said to the mother, so tell me about going to Disneyland. You said that you wanted to go to Disneyland and, and you're going to go to Disneyland next month. And she goes, I want to go to Disneyland. 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 And she was like, repeating it incessantly. And I said, hey, do you want to see a picture of my kid? And she goes, oh, yeah. Wow. Where, where is your son? And I told the story about my son. And she completely forgot about going to Disneyland. And so uh, at that point, the, the daughter said, are you kidding me? That's all it takes. <laughs> I said, yes. It sounds like such a simple thing, but it's not because you're involved in this interaction. And of course, all you're thinking is, for goodness sakes, I cannot get you to Disneyland. There is no way we're getting on a plane to go to Disneyland. And it takes you stepping back and going, hmm, this is completely illogical. I'm not going to win this battle. Let's talk about, hey, did you see the bunny that just jumped out from the alleyway? It's got his summer coat on. So if you can distract someone from it, it'll decrease the tension because um, he can't reason the same way he did. And trying to uh, just demonstrate your superior reasoning for why this decision should not happen is not going to make it any better and he's not going to see it uh, and it'll just be more stressful for you so trying to make it as as um, stress-free and reduce the conflict is is really important and in fact we showed that in toronto that um, without tranquilizing the patients just teaching the family members how to recognize when they were stressed and to try and either remove themselves or change the topic really resulted in less conflict. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I see we have two uh, questions in the chat here. So I'll read off an email one and then maybe we can get to the ones in the chat as well. Um, yeah, so this one came in over email. Um, my spouse has stomach pains between her medication scheduled times. Um, she is taking levocarb slash carbidopa uh, six times a day every four hours. Uh, to help extend the medication usefulness, she takes uh, entacapone um, three times a day. Uh, we have ruled out other medical issues with two years of numerous tests and have the constipation issue controlled as well. Her pains are quite severe 
And so the, then the question is, is this a common problem with Parkinson's and have some patients solved this problem? Uh, the pain eases after taking the medication, but always comes back before the next dose. Thank you. Uh, pain in general is probably more common and underrecognized in Parkinson's disease. Um, it is typically, as um, this writer has described, an off phenomena. So when the medication wears off and the benefits wear off. The challenge is, of course, trying to um, address the pain without making the person either dyskinetic or confused or lowering their blood pressure. And um, so it is challenging to address the pain always. Um, the other aspect is anticapone can cause uh, diarrhea or stomach cramps. And so it might be worthwhile seeing if uh, stopping the anticapone can help reduce uh, the symptoms for her. And uh, then finally, if you are finding that you have to give ever increasing doses and that this results in unacceptable side effects, there are other treatments to be considered like uh, Duodopa, which um, can help smooth out the response and currently is being studied about its um, ability to address non-motor symptoms. Great, thank you. Uh, and then this next one comes from the chat. Uh, so do you have any recommendations for young onset patients that help to slow down the progression of PD? Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, I would suggest exercise. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Currently there are no medications that have been shown to definitely slow the progression of illness. Resagiline might, in big capital letters, might, underline, 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 slow the progression of illness. But this has not been definitely proven to the FDA's satisfaction. And so the drug does not have a neuroprotective label. It also is fairly expensive and in general is not covered by most uh, provincial formularies. It is not covered by the Alberta formulary. So um, I recommend it for people if they have private insurance or if it is not going to be a financial hardship for them. Um, but again, exercise is probably the most potent um, modifier of Parkinson's that we have to date. So um, exercise needs to be moderate. And if you're young onset, you might be able to manage vigorous. However, if you've been sedentary for a long period of time, you should gradually start the exercise program because one of the biggest pitfalls of exercise is that you decide, well, when I was in college, I used to be on the rowing team. So I'm going to like start full bore. Um, but really start gradually, build up so that you avoid injuring yourself and above all, choose different exercise activities and um, something that you enjoy. So if you hate it, you're not going to keep doing it. Uh, try to choose something that's enjoyable to you. And in that vein, I have to say, some of my um, older patients do say, there's something really cathartic about punching the crap out of a bag. So boxing has been found to be very um, helpful for patients, probably because you have to do both your hands and your waist and your feet are moving at different times and you're alternating. But there is something good about really hitting something hard. Uh, it, it really does help you feel better. <laughs> Got to unmute myself there. Um, awesome. And then the other one from the chat is just generally about Cinemit. So my husband has been diagnosed with Parkinson's and has just been prescribed Cinemit. We read about the side effects and are worried about them. My husband is very sensitive to drugs. Um, what, if any, is there, uh, oh, sorry, this is, uh, what, 
side effects uh, could happen to my husband uh, during this time. We don't want to have to go to the emergency room. Um, any advice for starting out uh, on cinnamon? Um, in general, I have to say I've never had anyone go to the emergency department starting levodopa. So that's the first thing. Um, the other is that levodopa is still the most effective medication for the treatment of Parkinson's. It is uh, one of the oldest, but it is still the most effective. And that means when you take into account its benefits against its side effects. There is something um, among movement disorder neurologists we refer to levodopaphobia, where people go online, they read all sorts of horror stories and they don't wanna start it. They delay starting it, sometimes for many years and to their great detriment and they are harmed by st not starting it. Um, so in general, uh, I would say that even if you read the product monograph on vitamin E, you would be shocked at what is on it. Uh, so even things that we view as natural and therefore good have potential harms. The whole um, point is to one, use the dose that is prescribed, two, to start gradually, and uh, three, to keep in mind that levodopa not only is the most effective medication, but throughout the course of illness is probably the most commonly prescribed medication for the treatment of Parkinson's. And when all other medications have begun to fail or cause too many problems, levodopa will be the one drug that patients with Parkinson's continue to take. Awesome, thank you. Um, the last two can probably be combined, or the last two that I've got. Again, feel free to put your questions into the chat on the side there. Um, how do you know when you should be looking to downsize or move to an assisted living facility? especially if the spouse is resistant to moving? And then also, how do I know when my spouse can no longer be left home alone? Okay, two very good questions. So um, Declan, remind me of the second one if I go too much on the first one. For sure. Uh, I just need some water. So um, the first question about downsizing. Um, in general, uh, when I start a conversation with patients about downsizing or their living arrangements, it takes about two years before people actually act upon it. So um, if you were thinking about it now, it probably is a good time to start actually preparing, if nothing else. Um, and uh, many people do think about moving to assisted living. I just have this um, sort of caution. Assisted living is good for people who are fairly independent. Once you start needing nursing care, what many people don't um, realize is that everything you ask for is charged a la carte. And it is charged at a really exorbitant rate. And it is charged from the moment you make the phone call to say, I'd like the nurse to come and check my husband's blood pressure until the time she gets back to the nursing office. And so um, uh, again, tales from Dr. Miyazaki's uh, life. Um, my mother was in a very nice retirement residence. It had beautiful food. It was right on Avenue Road in Toronto. It was close to my work. And um, with a personal support worker, it was $9,000 a month. It used up all my mother's money and a lot of mine. Um, and the care wasn't that great, I gotta say, because it was through an agency. And so what I learned from that is to be very careful in advising people to move to an assisted living. I think 
Um, moving to a condominium or an apartment is a good option as long as you check that everything is on a single level that you can get out to the parking lot easily, um, that the doors are wide enough to, uh, in future, if you need it, use a wheelchair or a walker. But be careful about assisted living because it can end up being a huge financial cost for you. Um, if you're in your own apartment or condominium, uh, you can take advantage of, at least for now, managed care. So uh, what that means is that the envelope of benefits that you would have gotten through home care you will get the dollar amount for, and then you choose how you want to spend that money. So if you want to have a personal support worker and you can get them at nights, that's how you use the money. It might be a more effective way to manage um, increasing needs. Now, some people do have the financial ability to move to an assisted living for themselves, and they know that the assisted living has other levels of care that they hope to be able to transition to if their spouse needs more and more care. Um, this is, uh, if it works out, that's great because you're close, you're physically close, you know the institution and you know um, uh, sort of how, how it runs. Um, but you have to just really be careful when you're doing that because I think, um, and if you want to read some good articles about it uh, in the New York Times, they have several articles about seniors' homes or retirement residences and how many children, adult children, are choosing this for their parents and not realizing that in fact their parents may not have access to the nursing care that they expect or hope for. Um, the, the second question, you see, I did forget the second question. <laughs> <laughs> the second question is, how do I know when my spouse can no longer be left home alone? Ah, yes. Um, so, I would say in general, the doctors and nurses who are involved in your loved one's care probably have concerns before you do. Um, and that's because, not because we have something magical in our vision, but it's because we see someone periodically. And so we see this change. And when we see that a person is less able to give answers to the history and the spouse is providing more and more and more of the history, that's a sign that they're not doing as cognitively well. The other is when we suspect that medications are not being taken as prescribed. So the commonest uh, statement I hear about that is, oh, he looks after his pills and he's got them all lined out and I know that he's doing well. Um, inevitably, when someone says that to me um, and we have home care do medication um, reconciliation or checking, they find out that in fact the pills have not been taken properly. Um, so when people cannot take their pills uh, as prescribed, I think that's a, another sign. It's even a sign, um, there was a, a research study by family doctors and they asked patients just to describe their pills, give the, the name, the dose, and the times of day they took it. And if they couldn't do that, that was probably a sign that they weren't taking it properly. Um, so many of my patients say, well, I take the white one and I take it once a day. And then I take this other one that's kind of beige and I take, but they don't know the names or what they're for. Um, so that's another sign. The other is if someone is wandering or if they become very anxious when you try to leave the home, that is often a sign that um, they sometimes forget that you've left for a specific reason and you're coming back um, and they just don't know what to do 
if something happens while you're out of the house. So having a high level of anxiety would be another sign. And then finally, um, actual wandering is the most obvious sign. So some of our patients will wander um, either at night, in the middle of the night, or during the day. And that is a very clear sign that the person should not be left unattended. Great, thank you so much. Um, we've got three other questions which came up in the chat. Um, the first one being, my husband is having swallowing pro problems, including with his pills. Uh, what can we do to help this problem? Um, and then maybe this one could be bundled with it as well. Are there any foods, supplements, or over-the-counter drugs I should avoid? Uh, maybe they're not as relevant as I thought, but yeah, those um, two. So in terms of swallowing problems, yes, this is common in Parkinson's and often occurs in moderate stage uh, to late stage. So it's a misconception that swallowing problems only occur in um, late stage. In fact, when they do uh, special video fluoroscopy swallowing studies, people already have swallowing problems at moderate stage. So what a doctor would consider very mild to moderate Parkinson's disease when they're still walking independently. Um, it tends to be more of a problem when the pills have worn off. So um, that's one thing is to try and make sure that um, meal times are when the pills are working well. Reduce uh, distractions during eating. So we all do it, especially now. We sit in front of the TV and we eat our dinner. But um, that kind of distraction might be enough to cause swallowing problems because now swallowing has stopped being a reflex and is something that the person consciously has to do. Uh, by the same token, not asking them questions while they're eating and then they attempt to answer the question and they aspirate. Um, and cutting the food into small pieces. After each forkful or spoonful, putting the fork or spoon down, doing completely. Can you see me still? Yeah, okay, you're back now. Um, oh, but your video. Um... Can you see me because it said, I got to notice that my um, internet is unstable. Okay, um, can't see your video. Hello. Oh. Oh, yep. Okay, now it's back, okay. great, great. Okay, um, and uh, then, then other suggestions become, um, more intense as the swallowing problems get more significant. And so um, the uh, Parkinson Foundation in the United States has a nice booklet on speech and swallowing. And, and uh, you can access that online for free. Uh, so I would recommend that people uh, go to the Parkinson Foundation website, which uh, PAA is very closely uh, partnering with them and often uses their resources as well. Um, a swallow study can be helpful, more to confirm that uh, swallowing problems are happening. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, availability of speech language pathology experts for the adult world is quite limited. So at one point, our swallow studies were taking two years to book. Uh, now, more recently, is uh, gotten down considerably because Glenn Rose has worked really hard on that. But also having a video fluoroscopy by a speech language pathologist close to home could be helpful too. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then, okay, so there's a couple more. Are there any food supplements or over the counter drugs I should avoid? Uh, food supplements. Yeah, in general, I, I'm not a big believer in artificial things. Um, so I think it's better to eat natural stuff and eat more vegetables, um, uh, eat less 
uh, processed foods. And so the rule that most dietitians give you is that if you don't understand the label, don't buy it. Um, so when you actually read what's in things, you kind of go, oh, that doesn't sound really appetizing now that I read it. Um, so uh, I think eating lots of fruits and vegetables are helpful for people with Parkinson's to help with their bowel function. Um, trying to uh, stay away from cheese because that's constipating and constipation is already a problem for people with Parkinson's. And trying to eat more frequent smaller meals can also help people in terms of their absorption of their levodopa. In terms of supplements, the things that I do recommend for patients, particularly in Alberta, is vitamin D because vitamin D has been found to be deficient in people with Parkinson's. Um, a vitamin B supplement because levodopa can interfere with the absorption of some vitamin B um, some types of vitamin B. So a, just a generic B100 complex is helpful. Um, and otherwise, there are no other definite dietary deficiencies that have been found to occur in Parkinson's disease. Awesome, thank you. Um, so these will be the last two questions as we're coming up on an hour here. Um, can medications prescribed for Parkinson's hallucinations cause dementia or increase risk for developing dementia? Uh, so that's a tricky question. So um, most people who have hallucinations uh, already have cognitive decline. It is exceptional for someone to have hallucinations and not have cognitive decline. Um, and I think, I think, um, I think the only cases where I have seen people have hallucinations and not have cognitive decline are in people who had a pre-existing psychiatric disorder such as schizophrenia or a bipolar affective disorder, um, or they had a paranoid personality and then uh, developed frank psychosis. So in general, uh, the treatment for the hallucination should be to uh, minimize medications that might uh, worsen the psychosis, and then to try and treat the psychosis if the symptoms are bothersome or a danger to the person or to others around them. The commonest medications that are used and shown to be effective in the treatment of psychosis for Parkinson's are quetiapine and clozapine, neither of which have been shown to cause dementia in Parkinson's disease. These have been used for many decades and uh, in general have been found to be safe. Uh, people can have sedation with them because one of its uh, job is to sedate people to reduce uh, the psychosis. So you might have sedation as an unacceptable side effect. Um, that's my puppy. I apologize for the burping. Uh, and um, so in general, I would um, caution people about attributing the, the antipsychotic treatment to causing dementia. And usually because so many people sort of see that the quetiapine was prescribed and then they realized how demented their loved one was, I almost always uh, tell family members, you know, when the, the hallucinations and the delusions are gone, you may really realize for the first time how cognitively impaired your loved one is. Great, thank you. Um, and then the last one that we're gonna do is, is it appropriate to let young grandchildren know about grandpa's condition? Should I seek their parents' consent first? Um, well, uh, first of all, I would say that um, it is the person's truth to tell. I think that um, 
disclosing health information is very personal and it is um, in this instance uh, your husband's uh, right to tell and to share it with the people he wants to share this information. Of course, um, it needs to be done in a thoughtful way. Um, so to give the information in an age appropriate way uh, that children can understand and that they won't be frightened by, but might help them understand some of the things that they've noticed with grandpa. Maybe they notice that grandpa doesn't want to play cards with them anymore. Or maybe they feel that grandpa's always angry at them because his face has less expression. And now having an alternative um, explanation for these things can help the children actually understand and not take this personally, the changes that they've noticed in their grandfather. Great. Um, do you have time for one more question? One more came in sure. as we were ending. Okay, great. Um, my mother is in a long-term care. She gets up 10 to 14 times a night to urinate. We've tried working with a urologist, tried asking her to drink less water during the evening, uh, and staff indicate it is dementia and that it is something that happens with many patients. How can we change her thinking pattern so she doesn't get up as often? Mm. Uh, yeah, it is challenging because um, if you've worked with a urologist or a geriatrician, uh, because geriatricians often deal with continence problems, uh, and they've tried different medications and behavior modification, your mother may not be able to remember the things she's been taught. Uh, the other is how many of us wake up in the middle of the night and just because you woke up, you say, well, I'm up. I might as well go to the washroom. Um, and for us, we can do it. For your mother, unfortunately, she's dependent on others to ask to go. Um, that's a different situation from people who actually have pain because they're trying to urinate and they cannot urinate. If that's the case, um, then she should you should try again with the urologist or with the Glen Rose Continence uh, Clinic to see if there are other suggestions that can help because in that instance where someone is actually reporting pain uh, because they can't urinate it often is a problem where the bladder itself is contracting but the sphincter is not releasing and so the person can't void when they want to void that's a very different um, situation and should, um, uh, and medication should be tried in that instance. Okay, great. Well, that was the last question. Thank you so much um, to everybody that attended our very first webinar and we hope to have um, lots more of these. Have a good day. Super, thanks a lot. Thank you.